everything here is made for us to have a great event. And uh, at this stage, I would like to invite on the floor the main person who came here all the way from Oxford, Jonathan Fink. Please welcome. Whoa. Jonathan, nice to have you here. And the floor is yours. That's a great introduction. Thank you, Arrest. Thank you for making it happen. I am the world's most disorganized person. I couldn't have made even a fraction of this happen. It's thanks to Arrest, his genius for logistics, his team, the incredible camera crew he's brought together, Olya, who is a genius of pulling events together, uh, and I've learned so much about media. Let's, there we go, that's better. Um, it couldn't have happened without you. This and is, without you. And you. This is a joint inspiration. And I think this is an example of cooperation between Ukraine and the Western world, you know? It's not only about the world supporting Ukraine, Ukraine is, you know, doing something else. It's about cooperation. It's about being like 50-50, making 100 altogether. And I'm sure that today we'll have a 100% input about everything what we can make out of it. Absolutely. And this is also about the UK supporting Ukraine, because we know UK has been up there, up front, uh, supplying armaments, but supplying also moral support, and fighting back against Russian bullshit. So that's going to get this uh, video demonetized. But Russian bullshit doesn't get much traction in the UK. We, we smell it out, we don't believe it, we don't like it, and uh, this event is part of that fight against Russian bullshit and for Ukrainian victory. Let's go. Let's let's do our panels, yeah. So this first panel is all about volunteer society. Uh, there's two things I think that are important that I've learned since starting to do this. One is that Ukraine has an extraordinary, vigorous uh, civil society. It has a lot of volunteers that make up often for the deficiencies of perhaps the government, uh, but also Ukrainians see problems and they try to solve them. And that I think has inspired a lot of uh, foreign volunteers as well. And we've got a very strong panel this morning uh, of people who have really, you know, seen problems, come up with solutions and then just kind of got on with it. And uh, having an idea is one thing, putting it into action is another. So we're going to welcome up three fantastic guests on this panel who have really helped to contribute incredible solutions to the immense problems that Ukraine is going through. Uh, first on the stage, Johnny F.D. Come on up. So I'll do a, I'll do a short introduction to, to each and then we'll, we'll crack on with the questions. So Johnny is a YouTuber, digital nomad, and supporter of Ukrainian civil society and volunteer initiatives. Next we have Neil Tok. Neil. Noel. Noel. Sorry, my, my glasses have steamed up, so... Uh, uh, Noel is an animal rescuer at Nor Dog. He's a junior tactical puppy evacuator, part-time volunteer, works on fundraising, and occasionally wrestles uncooperative animals near front lines. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hear more about that in a minute. And lastly, we've got Brooks Newmark. Brooks, please join us. Now, Brooks is a former UK Member of Parliament. He's a businessman. He's an angel investor, philanthropist, former politician. He was a cabinet minister in a UK government. Um, he's got incredible influence and he's also a social reform campaigner. Now he's done extraordinary work through Angels for Ukraine. That's an initiative he's co-founded to help move not just thousands, it's tens of thousands, tens of thousands of Ukrainian civilians away from front lines to safety in Western Ukraine. It's an extraordinary initiative. He's been described as the modern day Oskar Schindler uh, and we're going to learn more about that in a minute. Um, this panel is all about people who've made things happen and made a difference. So we're, we're going to start by just hearing people's stories. I'm going to ask what has inspired each of our fantastic guests to come to Ukraine and help out. And just ask them to tell a little bit about their experiences of living and working here and making a difference. Brooks, let's start with your story. How long do I have? Let's, let's, let's give it 10 minutes each. I want to really okay, dive fine. into to your stories. That's good. That's a long time, uh, for me at least. Up to, up to. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so I've um, actually, like Jonathan, I'm, I'm actually at Oxford at the moment, at Oxford University, I'm doing a doctorate. Um, and I had uh, just finished my field research um, on the 24th of February. And um, I saw, uh, obviously I saw the news uh, that the Russians had invaded and I saw a post from a Latvian friend of mine on the border. So um, I was supposed to go scuba diving um, I cancelled my scuba diving and I said to my Latvian friend, can I come out for four days? And I arrived at the border and there was just absolute chaos. Um, and the first thing I want to do is particularly compliment the Polish people who were incredibly hospitable, very quickly housing people. Um, as I was there, I, I decided to stay a bit longer. So I stayed two weeks and I began to realize that there were Unfortunately, in war, there are unscrupulous people who were charging people lots of money to get away uh, from the war zone, particularly around Kyiv. So um, I decided to stay, and I said to my Latvian friend who's going back to Riga, can you get me three buses? And he got me three buses, and we went into Ukraine, um, and uh, we went up to Kyiv, and we started really just busing people away from the war zone, and then once the Russians were pushed out, um, I got a message uh, from the mayor's office that said, can you go down to uh, Zaporizhia and Vinitsa? Because there are a lot of people trying to get away from Mariupol. So I, I couldn't take my buses there because I didn't know the road. So I started working with one of the national bus companies, started busing people away, really who were escaping from Mariupol, taking them mainly to Lviv here. Um, and then um, eventually I ended up in Kharkiv and I was in Kharkiv for about six months and um, was evacuating people away from the frontline villages outside of Kharkiv because they were being bombed uh, daily and so on. I had two problems that I had to address. Um, one of them was that um, a bus drivers wouldn't go out to some of these villages. So I said, fine. Um, I will go out, uh, who will come with me? And I managed to find four bus drivers and two buses to come with me. So that sort of showed that if a, a bit of leadership that people would follow you. And once I got some bus drivers going out, others would, would follow. The next problem I had was that people were worried that we were kidnapping them and we're going to take them to Russia because it was for free. So uh, to overcome that problem, I charged 10 grivni. And people felt that, oh, if the, they're charging 10 grivni, which to outside listeners is about 10 cents or 10p, um, uh, then they can't possibly be kidnapping me. Um, and so um, we did that. The, the sort of, to help with that, I did a PR video on the national bus company's line saying the Brits are here. I'd use the phrase Boris Johnson, which would get claps because Boris is very popular here. And you have quite uh, the opposite effect if and, you do that on a British, <laughs> British bus company here. Uh, well, no, no, I'm a big fan of Boris, just don't <laughs> say that. Um, um, so, so then, um, eventually I stayed out, as I said, in Kharkiv, busing people away from the front line. Um, I, I ended up with, by the end of the year, 10 hubs around the country. So the great thing was, because I was in politics, I understood the importance of local government and networking with local government. So I got to know all the mayors, uh, all the way from Odessa, Mykolaiv, Kherson, Zaporizhia, Kharkiv, Sumy, Dnipro, Lviv, Kyiv, were where my hubs were, and they were virtual hubs, so I kept my costs down low. There were only a total of five of us doing all this, um, and by the end of the year, we had uh, managed to bus uh, to safety about 32,000 women and children from the frontline villages. Um, as you all know, things pivoted about a year ago when um, obviously there was a counteroffensive in Kharkiv, people started to go home. So we started doing medical evacuations and moving um, both civilians and soldiers away from frontline hospitals to civilian hospitals. We did that for about three months and then the Ministry of Health said we'd like to do a partnership with you because you're doing such a good job. So we did a formal partnership and we ended up probably over about a three month period um, evacuating uh, up to about 10,000 uh, wounded soldiers and civilians. 
as winter kicked in, I had sort of phase three of what I was doing. So I went from sort of civilians to medical evacuation. Uh, we then did basic humanitarian aid. And what I found was, um, in the same way, the big organizations were not going out to the front line because of their health and safety protocols. Um, a lot of the humanitarian aid was not getting to many of the frontline villages. It would get to the bigger towns, bigger cities, but nobody, but nobody was going to the frontline villages. So I got literally truckloads of warm clothes, warm blankets, pillows, uh, generators, uh, basic medical equipment. And throughout the winter, first quarter of this year, was going out to um, uh, frontline villages, mainly in, in the east and also in the south. So uh, that, in essence, is my story. Is that under it, 10 minutes? It's, it's, you, you could talk for as long as you want. I mean, that okay. is an incredible story. Uh, it, it's uplifting. Uh, I think it's also very much in the spirit of Ukraine, which is seeing a problem and not just you know, whining or why isn't the government doing something about this. Yeah, as I, I we, mean, we get a lot of that in the UK. Here, I think it's inspiring to see how people try to resolve their problems. And I have to say, this is the one great thing about the voluntary sector here in Ukraine. So I was Minister of Civil Society, and the active civil society in Ukraine is amazing. But there's civil society people from all around Europe, the US, and around the rest of the world that have come in to do their bit. And so I think it's incredible. I think those of us on the outside have been very frustrated at the slowness, which I'll get into maybe later mm. on, of the Western response to the crisis. Um, uh, and we, those of us who are here, I'm sure we'll all feel the same. We just felt we had to do something. I think yeah. this innate urge to do something rather than shout at the TV or just shout at other people out there. We just had to come in and do something. Or and I think it's out. I mean, a lot of people in the UK, and the UK is one of the most active places, a lot of people I know just tune out. They don't want to hear the news, but this is a pivotal moment in history. Yeah, and but the, well big, for Ukraine. the bigger problem, which we can get into again mm -hmm. later, is the USA. Yeah. I think that's the UK, I have to say, across all political parties, mm. is united in their support for Ukraine. Yes. I would say out of any country uh, maybe uh, uh, except perhaps some of the Baltic states and, and Poland, the UK is absolutely 100% united behind Ukraine. Um, and I think whichever shade of government yes, gets yes, in, um, uh, you know, you will have, or the people of Ukraine will have the support of the British people. 100%, and there's no Russian protests on the streets. That wouldn't be tolerated for a second no. by ordinary British people. They just jump all over that and stop it. It's not quite like Germany, where I know a lot of that's happened. So the UK is 100% behind it. Well, let's come to some more stories. We will, we will come back, because I think you raised some interesting points there. We're going to talk about bureaucratic challenges. We're going to end this session uh, on what the West actually can learn from civil society and its resilience here. But let's turn to, to, to Noel, because I think, you know, all this human stuff is great, but puppies and dogs, that, that's what's going to get the most views here. Um, but it also speaks, I think, to the humanity of Ukrainians, because one of the things that really comes across is not just that every Ukrainian life matters and what people are doing, the extraordinary lengths they're doing uh, to, to, to rescue people, to protect their soldiers, to protect their civilians, they're also protecting animals at the same time. And I think that, that talks to Ukraine's humanity and, and their values. No, let's hear your story, because again, it's, it, this is inspiring as well. And you've got some extraordinary numbers around you know, the number of animals rescued, the quantity of dog food you were telling me about last night. Let's, let's hear your story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the first thing I'll say is, uh, Brooks, thank you very much for the inspiring story. Uh, I didn't realize at all you had done all that, and it's, uh, I feel like I can learn a lot from you. So thank you for sharing that. Um, my name is Noel. Uh, I'm Swiss, and I guess in my day job, uh, I have two jobs now, uh, but in my day job, I, over the last 10 years, I've built up a, a web agency, if you will, uh, with my two friends, and we have about 60 employees, and we work in open source. So we've been contributing to WordPress uh, very largely, and WordPress is a very popular piece of software on the web. Um, we've created the REST API for that, for example, which is the way that 43% of the web connects to the other uh, 57. Um, so we've, we've gone to great lengths to not only create some of the technology, but also host um, websites and media that are there to, um, I guess, protect democracy and freedom at large. Um, such as Rappler.com in the Philippines. 
but I didn't realize the, the sort of tie-in and the kind of overlap between you know, the work I did before and then you know, the sort of natural segues that come into this. I didn't come into the Ukraine uh, by some kind of explosive action like Brooks did. I was, I'd, I'd say, quite passive reactive. Uh, didn't even realize it to, to an extent. It was more a, a latent kind of thing in my mind. And I was like, okay, I'll donate, I'll donate. Uh, you know, spread the word, you know, social media or whatever. Um, but ultimately, I, I didn't have that, that kind of trick, you know, and in my mind it was like, hey, let's go do that. And, it, and I feel like in other parts of my life I've done that with my friends, you know, I've been nomadic for 10, 11 years, 11 years now, um, and I've, you know, brought them to, you know, financial independence or other things and kind of moved them into that direction, but I didn't have that, that drive to go do that thing, and it took another friend to do that for me, uh, and that's Fred, who's you know sitting in the front row. Uh, Fred, you can put your hand there. That's Fred, and you know he started this. He said, "Hey, I'm going down to Ukraine." He saw it on TV, uh, just like you did, and said, "I'm going to go save dogs." And you know, without you know flinching, went and did that. And last year, he asked me, "Hey, do you want to help?" I said, "Yes, of course." Um, and then earlier this year, um, I was supposed to have hip surgery, and that got canceled. And then he said, "Hey, you want to come to Ukraine?" And, Obviously, you know, like, I'll come, you know, you go where your friends go. So, you know, I found myself here, and we have uh, a charity here called Nordog. Uh, so if you talk to me after, I do have a patch for everybody. Uh, I've, I've printed some out, uh, picked them up in Kiev. Uh, the printing lady was <laughs> a bit stressed out getting them all out, out the door. But uh, there's one for everybody, so just come up and introduce yourself, and I'll be happy to give you one. And Nordog you know, really started off as animal evacuations um, in the occupied areas, front lines. Uh, so really the animals that are most at risk. And there's a lot of that, you know, there's people who fled the country. Uh, some people think of their animals as a kind of guard mechanism as opposed to a part of the family. Uh, and that's some, you know, difference in culture. So, we, you know, we may find a very nice house and then there's, you know, two shepherds in the back uh, that were just left behind. Uh, but the BMW and the handbag went with, you know, so. Um, you know, there's sometimes, you know, pretty large discrepancies in that regard, but we, we try to evacuate as many animals as we can, uh, all the way from Volchansk, Kupiansk, down to Chasivyar, all the way down to Kherson, and, you know, try to find the dogs wherever they are. And we've built up an operation at this point where it's not just, hey, let's get them out and let's bring them somewhere, uh, which was kind of the, you know, the point last year. But this year, we really have a shelter uh, in South of Kharkiv. You are all welcome to come visit it. We always have some puppies around that you can play with. Um, but, you know, last, the other day, we were up to 46 dogs or so. And what's important to remember is that, you know, as we're growing up, as we're building, as we're vertically integrated now, we're, we're evacuating, we're bringing the dogs back to the shelter, we're sterilizing them, we're feeding them, we're bringing them back to life, and then we're rehoming them with, you know, our two salespeople that are on Facebook groups the entire time. Um, we're, we're trying to figure out where does this go next? You know, where are we in the life cycle of this? What do we do before victory? What do we do after victory? Um, so the way we approach this now is very much um, the sort of CNVR model, which is you know, capture, uh, neuter, vaccinate, and then release. Uh, that would be you know, our goal now with a mobile clinic, sterilization, growing in that direction. But at the same time, there's also other needs where dogs can help. Um, we can uh, potentially help in demining uh, operations. Um, so we, we've, you know, we found out that we actually have all the requisite, requisite licenses to uh, train working dogs between all the people we have inside of our group. Um, and we uh, you know, are well aware of what is needed to do that. So there is that side of um, the sort of humanitarian demining uh, priority, which is a, a large priority for Ukraine. Um, and then there's something maybe on the back end of the, you know, victory and war uh, that is uh, treating PTSD and trauma uh, with uh, dogs. So it's been shown in studies that dogs help reduce symptoms by 80% in the long term, and uh, they help reduce medication by 50% just in one week. So there's, there's a lot we can do. Uh, there's, there's a lot we can do in terms of not only helping dogs, as you say, um, and you know how dogs fit into the fabric of society, like art does, or like um, our, our relationships with people and other things do, but how can dogs also give back in, in a way and, and become? Because they like to, you know, please us. So, how can they become working dogs that also benefit society? So we are in um, 
like I said, we are in Kharkiv. Um, we have a leadership team of four of us, uh, Fred and myself, and two other counterparts, um, uh, which are Pavel and Sveta. Uh, Pavel is the, the championship of hunting with dogs in uh, the Ukraine, and she's the champion of show dogs in the Ukraine. So we've amassed somewhat of an amazing team, um, and we're just looking to kind of like a good startup, try to be as useful as you can in the highest impact areas and drive the most value uh, for the Ukraine. And imagine, just like the sort of people that uh, Brooks will come across, there must be things like malnutrition, uh, injuries, trauma. I mean, you're dealing with a whole range of, of problems. Uh, absolutely. And we have a vet on standby. He comes by once a week, Oleg. Um, and, you know, he's very kind to, you know, give us his time at a very, very discounted rate. Um, but. Yeah, we, we sterilize all the dogs and then often, you know, the military will call us. Uh, so I was just in Slovyansk, uh, you know, just two weeks ago picking up uh, another dog. And we, we go there in, in that kind of Kramatorsk region pretty often uh, to just pick up dogs that have been hit by shelling. Mm. Um, you know, like the other day it was a, it was a German Shepherd that had uh, been quite close to shelling. So it had, you know, a concussion of, you know, for three days just kind of puking, walking around with not, you know, just disoriented. And that's, you know, a soldier's dog that is, you know, they've created a, a very tight bond. And he calls us and he says, hey, can you take care of this dog uh, and bring it? The soldier hasn't uh, yeah, so, been you know, moved on or hasn't we're, made it. Yeah. We're, we're able to bring this dog, um, you know, back, bring it to life, make sure it's healthy, um, and then, you know, deliver it to the family. And, you know, when we rehome or provide dogs up for adoption, it's a bit like Amazon Prime. We, we bring you the dog the next day. Uh, so if you're anywhere in Western Ukraine, we will deliver the dog. Um, so you can absolutely have one of our shelter puppies. But you know, this dog then goes to his family, and he, you know, you know, you know, assuming he comes back from the war, um, and you know, let's hope he does, um, he'll have that rock um, to to rely on, you know, from a, a psychological perspective. I hope my son's not watching this because he's going to want a puppy from Ukraine, and that's that's not happening. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll find his Facebook profile and reach out. <laughs> Well, let's move on to Johnny's story, because when the war hit, there were a lot of foreigners in Ukraine. There were a lot of YouTubers, a lot of people on media, a lot of people who are living a sort of nomad lifestyle. And, you know, as the first shells were hitting, many of them were running for the train stations, just getting out of here. And that, that I was a little disappointed, because, you know, to an extent, you know, some of them would, would go to the sort of front lines during that eight-year war and they'd film themselves and they're getting this sense of, like, I, I don't know, false bravery or whatever. Um, Johnny hung around, Johnny came back and really living in Ukraine, uh, making connections here has been a big part of what he does. Um, he puts out a lot of videos per month, we'll, we'll come to the details in a minute, but he's trying to record Ukrainian life. Um, he's trying to tell the stories of Ukrainians. Um, he hooks people up with a lot of charitable and charitable causes and, you know, tries to make videos on those to highlight the work they're doing. Um, so, Johnny, tell us a little about your story and, in particular, why you didn't flee uh, as, as many, many have done. Dobby uh, didn't everybody. <laughs> So uh, I go by Johnny FD on my YouTube channel. Before the war, I worked in you know online marketing. I became a travel vlogger uh, for many years. And in 2020, after 10 years of living out of a backpack and just traveling around uh, as a digital nomad, I decided to settle down. And out of the 50 countries that I had visited and uh, many I lived in, Ukraine was actually the place I had chose. Um, I didn't want to go back to the U.S. Uh, mainly because it was hard to travel anywhere else from there, but I wanted to be in Europe, and I also wanted to be close to, you know, uh, Asia. And Kyiv really was like the perfect center of the world. You know, when the airports were still open, we had two amazing airports. Uh, but while you were there, you had great people, you had amazing food, you had this really comfortable life. And throughout the years I lived there, I ended up getting residency, I bought an apartment, and I really started seeing my future, uh, you know, at least you know, most of the year in Ukraine. And when there was all this talk about you know, Russia you know, building up troops uh, near the border you know, two years ago, I didn't believe it. I, I didn't think that Russia was gonna be stupid enough to invade Ukraine. 
I knew Ukrainians, and I knew that they would never give up their land, they would never give up their freedom just because they were attacked. And I knew they would, they would never win. So up until February 24th, 2022, I didn't believe it. If, if you asked me, I would have said, no, Russia isn't stupid enough to attack. This is 2022, this isn't you know, the 1940s anymore. Those days of imperialism are gone. And unfortunately, I woke up to about 80 text messages uh, and a mad scramble. And actually, I was one of the YouTuber floor, uh, foreigners who fled in the early days. Uh, but the difference is, I came back. You know, um, in the beginning, it was so unknown. You know, I uh, I didn't know what to do. I felt like I needed to do something. So I started volunteering in Poland, going to demonstrations in Hungary, and just trying to do whatever I could. But I very quickly realized that me you know, uh, organizing donation clothes, uh, wasn't really doing that much. And I thought, you know, maybe I can do more. I had this big audience on YouTube that had over 200,000 subscribers at the time. Uh, and I thought, maybe I can highlight what's actually happening in Ukraine while the momentum's going, be before people start forgetting and start going on to the next trend or the hot uh, news item. And I came back and I just started highlighting things I was doing. And I would try to do things on my on my own or with friends and a small team. You know, we would you know we went to the um, you know the the big market, uh, and we would buy like five hundred dollars worth of dog food and drive it you know to the shelters and give it away. And at first, it felt like you know a very significant thing until I realized dogs eat a lot, <laughs> and five hundred dollars worth of dog food doesn't last very long. And you know this was coming out of you know the, the donations I was personally collecting, or even out of my own pocket. And I realized this isn't sustainable. I can't do this forever. So I realized, you know what? I need to just highlight other charities that are doing it already, that have the team in place. Uh, and basically, since the start of the war, at least once a week, I would visit uh, either a charity or organization and team up with them to help uh, raise money. So all together, I've raised definitely over $100,000 for various charities, the biggest being Razam for Ukraine, uh, which uh, just them, I raised $40,000 for them. And I feel like the audience um, from the US uh, that mo mostly watches my videos, this is a, an, a way for them to connect with a person that they've known and they trusted for a long time. Uh, and they can see it through my eyes as a civilian. You know, I never had any uh, military experience. I would be completely useless on the front lines. But what I can do is help the people who are there. I've helped them now get night vision, get body armor, uh, three vehicles already, and actually I'm working on a fourth uh, vehicle for the NAFO 69th Sniffing Brigade, the best, best name in the world. Uh, and, Hashtag NAFO. Yeah. Hi, NAFO. Yeah, well, hello, NAFO. <laughs> Thanks for representing. Uh, so, you know, all together, it, it's been kind of a, an honor, a privilege, but also I feel kind of like a duty as someone who was living here before the war to do whatever I can to help out. And Johnny, I mean, a, you raise a good point here, I think, because we've got people involved in some extraordinary charities. These charities require a ton of money to do their work. It's not just the passion and expertise of people. They need money. Private individuals, they also need corporate sponsors. We know that there are large corporations still paying into the Russian treasury, uh, arming the Russian war machine. We also need corporations to contribute to the Ukrainian cause. Um, so we'll, we'll pop some links into, the, in, into these videos, but there's Razon for Ukraine, there's Come Back Alive, there's uh, Unbroken, uh, and there's, there's many other superhumans. Uh, you'll see more videos about these uh, as, as uh, we put them on the channel. But there are extremely uh, trustworthy and validated Ukrainian uh, charities that you can be absolutely assured are not going to spend on bureaucracy. This money is going to go and, and help people. So if you're at all worried about giving and you're worried about scammers, because there's a lot of scams going on, and there always is in, in any war situation, there are some incredibly trustworthy and beneficial charities. And we'll, we'll certainly put those links and, and help advise people about what they should do if they want to take part, if they've been inspired by the stories we've heard here. Well, let's turn to some of our questions. Um, and I think one of the big topics that's come out here is this idea of private initiatives, uh, of civil society filling the gaps 
which the state doesn't fulfill. Um, you know, Ukraine doesn't have a Soviet government anymore, but at the same time, you know, the state is still evolving. It's not solving all society's problems. And as in many societies, bureaucracy can be slow and cumbersome and, and not reactive, you know, when, when stuff is required. So the question here is, what is, uh, you know, our speaker's impression of the effectiveness of civil society and what is unique about it in Ukraine? Brooke, let's start with you. Um, well, I think, I, I, I certainly think the Ukrainian people, I don't think I've ever seen a, a response from ordinary people, particularly young people. I think a lot of um, the civil society movements have been driven by the young as opposed to uh, the um, people my age, but I'll put it that way. Um, and I think for me that's what's been inspiring. Um, a lot of it has been driven through social media though, rather than action on the ground. Um, I have to say, as an observation, I've been, and I've been everywhere, I probably know Ukraine better than I ever thought I would, and probably better than most Ukrainians now. Um, uh, um, uh, I, I'm sort of disappointed with the big, with the big organizations. I think I've seen the Red Cross once, once in 16 months, uh, wherever I've been, and I've been close to the front line, both in the south and the east. I'm sure they're there somewhere, never seen them. But they're heavily fundraising. I mean, uh, they, I they've been fundraising. No, I think a lot time, of the yeah. a lot of the big charities have been fundraising, but I don't see any people on the ground. I I've seen boxes of stuff, so there's certainly some of the goods are getting through, um, but I don't see many people. And um, I gave a talk um, uh, in Oxford, I guess, about eight weeks ago, entitled "Being a Social Entrepreneur in a War Zone." Um, and really, individuals are filling gaps in the, in the market. Um, I think when it comes to the bureaucracy here in Ukraine, it's as frustrating as it is everywhere else in the world, unfortunately. Mm. Bu bureaucrats are not enablers, they're disablers. Bureaucrats, their whole raison d'etre is never to take a risk and always to say no, because you can never be wrong saying no. Uh, and that's as much of a problem here um, as it is uh, elsewhere. I think the, when I look at local government, I think local government uh, has been better. Uh, certainly some of the smaller towns and villages have been incredible, particularly the smaller villages. Um, the leadership with the equivalent of council leaders and so on has been um, very, very good. So, um, and I'll give you a couple of examples, well, I'll give one example. So when I go to a village, we've already been in contact with the mayor and the mayor has contacted a village senior person and they will have a list of people and exactly what they need. So they will let us know. So rather than just tipping loads of stuff that people don't want, we will have a list. And when I get there, there'll be, I don't know, 120 people, they'll be on a list and, and the, it's usually a, a lady, will read out the name, they will come to the back of our truck and we will give them what they need. And um, so from that way, civil society or local local government has been very effective from what I've seen. The problem is more at a macro level with big governments. And I think even if you speak to the soldiers, particularly at the beginning of the war, they weren't getting the equipment that they need, the basics that they uh, needed and so on. And so again, this is where civil society stepped in. A lot of voluntary groups, um, were then giving the soldiers what they needed, whether it was night vision, whether it was body armor, whether it was boots, whether it was basic clothes. So I think civil, this, this has been a very good example of civil society in action this war, and I've certainly been very impressed with what I've seen. Fantastic. And, and Noel, you must have uh, bumped up against sort of bureaucratic hurdles in the work you're doing and uh, the logistics that are required to make it happen. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be more optimistic than, than that. I think, you know, as, as Brooke said, there's these challenges everywhere. It's not something that's new to the Ukraine or anything like that. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd go a step further and say, you know, even at, at the charitable level, that we, and, and this may be contrarian to a certain degree, but that charities compete and should compete. Um, I, I view this, you know, I, the reason I'm doing this 
after I'm 40, and I'm 42 now, is because when I was 27, I said I'd be uh, self-employed by the time I'm 30, and I'd you know, be working, I'd be contributing a lot of my time to NGOs when I'm 40, because I'd leverage all that experience to go do NGO work. And I'm more frustrated by the large organizations than I am local government, uh, if, if I'm honest. Like, I, the same as Brooks, I haven't seen any of these uh, organizations, you know. Uh, MSF, I've definitely seen, you know, so respect to them. Um, but the Red Cross and UN, yeah, good luck. And, you know, I'd say, you know, from a logistical point of view, um, you know, we're not relying on overseas donations. We don't have an overseas team. We act like a startup in that regard. So we produce our food in Kharkiv. We produce 10,000 kilos a week, 40,000 kilos a month of dog food, and then distribute it in the same logistical manner that Brooks just described, where we have someone in the town that has the list of names because we're not throwing food on the street because that just creates larger problems. I mean, it's good for Instagram, but it just, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not good for the long term. So, you know, in that same vein, I think the, the best businesses or charities, if we can call them that from, you know, from a hypothetical point of view in Ukraine today are based on handshakes and telegram groups. And that is, you know, the rawest form of cooperation <laughs> and value generation that can be created at the best efficiency that is just unreplicable by large organizations. And this is an irony which, which we won't come to in this panel here, but we will be looking at the role of social media in, in Ukrainians' victory because it's a, it, social media is a huge enabler of freedoms, but also it can be used by the worst uh, aspects of humanity. And of course, Russia has weaponized social media to spread lies and falsehood. But uh, it's, it's fascinating to hear its use and its power uh, for good for those who are well-intentioned people. Um, I'm going to ask a different question. We're going to go on to the next question, but I'll just start with Johnny, um, just to shake things up a bit and, and get as many questions I, actually, as we sorry, can. Oh, you, I have a lot to say about this bureaucracy. Go, go, go. <laughs> have a word on this one, then. Yeah. So, I mean, first off, uh, you know, to just quickly mention the, the social media thing, uh, because I have a public vlog, I get a lot of haters. I get stalkers. I get, you know, Russian bots. I get, you know, people, someone even emailed Jonathan saying, oh, you know, like, Johnny's a piece of crap, you know, piece of crap, you know. I'm always going to have that because we're a public guy. But at the end of the day, as long as we know we're on the right side of history, that's all that matters. You know, this is why uh, organizations like NAFO are so important because they combat this, this disinformation. All right. So as far as uh, the bureaucracy, uh, it's, these big organizations are very slow. And I want to give, share one story about UNICEF, this, this you know, big, you know, big organization you've seen. Uh, they, it's funny, uh, there was a small Ukrainian school, a bunch of teachers from Odessa uh, went to Romania as refugees, wanted to start the school. They got a free place um, to, to host a classroom, but they had zero money for salary, books, pencils, anything. And the teachers are like, well, like, we're going to apply from a grant from one of these big organizations because they have millions of dollars. You know, chefs, like, we got you. Don't worry. They came over. They sent boxes of um, what turned out to be just bright blue Unichef backpacks that were empty with a photographer. They had all the kids pose with these backpacks. <laughs> they took the photos, and then they didn't hear from them for two months. <laughs> and they thought they just got scammed. They're like, oh, man, you know, they just gave us empty backpacks. Uh, during those two months, small organizations like mine or through, they had their own private GoFundMe. These things, like we were, we were able to keep these students in the classroom, these teachers paid a basic salary, and just, it, they survived for those two months. The good news is after two months, UNICEF actually came back and started paying their salaries and did, did everything. They're just slow, you know? Some um, really big organizations, like the Red Cross, not only are they slow, but they're also spread out, they have a lot of money that's wasted, and even though, you know, between, you know, February and let's say July 2022, probably 90 or 100% of donations were intended for Ukraine, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, but maybe 1% actually went to Ukraine, because some of that went, you know, to some other causes somewhere else, maybe some of it went to private jets, some of it went to, you know, who knows, right? Um, but what I'm saying is, that's why it was always so important to, to to you know, work with small local organizations that you actually see them on the ground doing something. Uh, for the first six months of the war, it was vital 
to have small kind of hands-on um, you know, volunteers. I mean, we literally drove to border towns uh, near Russia, you know, on the Ukrainian side, uh, or to previously de-occupied areas like Hostomol or Pinbucha during the first couple of months. I remember it was like April or May 2022, like just after they were liberated, we would go there with, you know, uh, trucks full of bread or soup, and we would meet people that otherwise had no other way to eat. You know, there was one guy on a bicycle that said he actually bicycled to Kiev. <laughs> That's a really, like, like an hour bicycle <laughs> just to get some groceries. And it was vital to do that. But six months later, a year later, things like that are not needed. Supermarkets are in place. Big uh, organizations like Red Cross should have had their time to actually do what, what they're intended to do. It is no longer uh, our job as small volunteers to do that. Uh, so I do think there's a place for both, but bureaucracy is the killer of all things great. And, and I really hope that it, that gets squashed during this war. Well, I'll follow up on that, because I think this is, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll find this one at Brooks, and then we'll move on to the next question, but there's this slowness of bureaucracy, but there's also an aspect where I think they're perhaps more risk averse. And I think you mentioned that in your intro. They, they see the need, but they won't send their people uh, to the front. They won't send their people into any danger, perhaps for, for legal reasons. Um, but also when you had something like the Kohovka Dam, uh, they, they know what's happening, but they, they, they wait for more information. You know, they want to be absolutely certain that Russia did it. They want to be absolutely certain of what's going on the ground. So where the immediate need is there, these large organizations are risk averse uh, in the moment when they're needed. Is that, is that fairly accurate? Yeah, it is. And uh, unfortunately, it's probably driven by the lawyers in all these organizations because they're just risk averse, right? They're gonna, it's easier to say, no, let's, let's do our, our reviews and checks and everything else. And there's no concept of, actually, we are a rescue operation. Therefore, we should have things set up beforehand that says immediately there's a crisis. Within 24 hours, we will do this. Within 48 hours, we'll do this. Within 72 hours, we will do that. So that it's already set up, rather than almost reinventing the wheel every time there is a crisis. And I can guarantee you, if you're at the IR International Rescue Committee or Red Cross or Maison Frontières, there are crises almost every day, right? So therefore, I don't understand as a business guy, and I'm a business guy really at heart, what, why they have not set up a much more efficient system in delivering what people are giving them money for. The second thing is there is no clarity and real transparency on central costs and the point um, that, that you made, which is if I give a dollar, I want to know that at least 90 cents of that dollar is going to Ukraine, not into a black hole to pay for a bunch of other things. Now, the way I set up my charity, I said, you know, I funded a chunk of it myself. So I have spent a million dollars, just over a million dollars, to uh, help 32,000-ish people, plus humanitarian aid, and so on. I put up a quarter of that myself. Um, but my main pitch is, Zero, zero amount goes towards central costs. Any central costs I pick up with my Latvian partner uh, and we pay for that ourselves out of our own pocket. So you know that if you give us a pound or a dollar or a euro, that is going directly to what we are doing in Ukraine and we give monthly reports back to our supporters. So our supporters know what we are achieving with their money. And the important thing to do is communication with people who are uh, supporting you. And I just want to add one other thing on the animal side of things, because you really can tell what a society is about in the way it treats its animals. And I have to say, when I um, was first uh, came and I went to some of the frontline areas like you did, Bucha, Borianka, Irpin, which were a complete mess, there would be these little old ladies who would go out and would give the animals just food, just random, you know, random strays. And then on the flip side, you would go into some other villages, which I did, in which uh, that had been recently deoccupied, in which the Russians had used the animals as target practice. 
And that is the difference between Russians and Ukrainians, is Russians have a complete, and I mean a complete, lack of humanity in any sense of the word humanity. I know you have other questions. I'm just going to I add. do have other questions. It actually leads on from that one because my next question was going to be about transparency, probity, the need for actually publishing accounts and being sure that at least, you know, 90% of your donation is going to be spent locally and to be used locally for the cause that you've uh, that you've um, committed it to. So the question really was and this also extends to Ukrainian government. I mean, there are people who are very strong advocators for publicly accessible contracts, for e-processes, to bring this level of transparency to the whole of governance. And dare I say, you know, the UK could learn uh, something from that too. I think every society can. But charities are leading the way, or the good charities are leading the way, in being far more transparent about the sources of their income and how it is disposed. So I'd love to, to know your experiences of that. And, and what you guys are doing to, to bring that level of transparency to the sector? That's a great question. Um, we've, you know, we're in a position where we're raising a, a fair amount of money. Um, you know, our, our operating costs are just shy of 100K per month um, between dog, dog food, vehicles, and everything. And we're highly efficient through that. And we were just talking the other day about, because we had our board meeting, um, we, just, we were just talking about, you know, let's bring transparency to this. Uh, and a lot of this is playing catch up, right? Like you, you go out in the field, you, you try to save as many animals as you can. You're like, hey, let's produce food. And then you get a phone call here, let's go do that. So you're always like in, in the thick of it and, you know, you're, you're playing catch up. But um, I, I think that's, old, that's, that's very much a priority because I think if you run a charity today, and a lot of you do, um, this is your chance to, to build something that is going to ultimately divert funds away from these large organizations which are inefficient, and this is the time to do so. And I absolutely believe that you know, there's, there's starting to be room for meta charities, if you will. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly some charities that do logistics for other charities uh, because the country is so big, uh, but we don't necessarily have like a charity navigator or anything like that that reviews all the charities um, financial records, if you will. Uh, but I think, you know, getting to a place like that would be very valuable for donors and the, the broader public uh, to see. My last comment is, if you're an investigative journalist and want to understand how humanitarian societies are being very deceptive, please contact me. Fantastic. Yep. I invite everyone to get involved. Um, and also, later when we have the Q&A, uh, we're inviting our online audiences to submit questions there, so I'm sure lots of in interesting angles will, will come up. Um, one of the questions, of course, is about Ukrainian identity and the resilience which is helping Ukraine fight Russia, beat Russia. Um, that resilience and that character is very much on show in the charitable sector, in the, in the sort of civil society organizations. So I'd love to hear each of your individual impressions as outsiders of what Ukrainian resilience looks like, feels like, and what its role is going to be in an eventual Ukrainian victory. I have absolutely no doubt that Ukraine will win. Uh, I also have no doubt that Ukrainian soldiers will defend this country no matter what, whether it's with sticks and stones or with high Mars and uh, you know, Western support. I, hope that doesn't dry up and end. But I also understand that people in the US or in the West, you know, they have their own problems. They, after a year, you know, they get tired of hearing these stories. And to be quite frankly, you know, they look at, you know, our social media and they see, oh, you know, there's a you know, beach party in Kiev or something, people are having fun. You know, why, why is their life in, in Ukraine during war better than my life uh, in the US? <laughs> And what they don't realize is, like, life in Ukraine, in some senses, has always been better than life in the U.S. or the West. For some people, yeah. <laughs> For some people, yeah. But even with that, you know, even people who didn't earn a big salary, they would go almost every weekend to the lake, have a sashlik, a barbecue, spend time with the family, you know, go and have a bottle of sparkling wine at a fancy-looking, you know, uh, nightclub or uh, at a bar, not realizing that 
it's not expensive to do here. I mean, you can literally get a bottle of sparkling wine for ten dollars at many bars. You know, uh, you know, it, it doesn't cost any money to go to the to the lake or to have a barbecue. We just, ha you know, Ukrainians just value their free time, their time with the family, their you know, their freedom, and it's it's hard to wrap around uh, what is war because most people in the world have never had to experience it themselves, and I pray and I hope they never have to themselves. You know, this is why on my channel, I try to show the daily life of Ukraine as well, what, you know, things are like. I try to have, you know, Ukrainian, you know, friends kind of show what they're going through, what, you know, what war actually looks like. But I sprinkle in, you know, things that actually happen. So thank, you know, not, not uh, in a good sense, but thank God that Russia was stupid enough to attack Kyiv during the day one time when I happened to be out filming because I was able to show, yes, Restaurants are open. Yes, people are on the streets. People are dressed nice and smiling. Uh, you know, yes, McDonald's is open, all right? But randomly, we'll get a rocket attack. You know, kids will be screaming. People will be running for, you know, for the shelter. You know, there'll be a real risk of damage to your, your house, your property, to your life. And every single person in Ukraine, you know, whether you're in a very safe city like Lviv, where the chances of you personally dying are very small, Every single person has a friend or a relative that has suffered physically, financially, mentally from this invasion. Yeah. And people aren't fighting to stay depressed and miserable and in poverty. They're fighting for a quality of life. And you know, from my own experience, my grandmother who fled poverty in rural Ireland in the 1930s lived through the Blitz in London and she liked to drink and she went dancing almost every night and then worked in a, I think it was a, a Lancaster bomber factory during the day. That's quite worrying actually, the kind of mistakes she probably made. But um, people have a right to live their lives and defend that, that, that ability there. Um, no, Absolutely, I, yeah. and also on, on that point, I have friends who are you know, both Ukrainian friends as well as Western volunteers who are on the front lines. And when they come back to Kyiv, they want to go to a nice restaurant. They want to go have some drinks. They want to have normal life. Because first, it's R&R, &R, it's rest and recovery. But second, it's a reminder of what they're fighting for. Yeah. So no, th yeah, let's get to know, because I think you, yeah, you touch upon an interesting thing there. People have a unique bond with, with, with their animals here, and that must tell you a lot about the sort of resilience and character of the people. Yes, uh, what's, what's the question? Just it, <laughs> following on about, you know, you oh, okay, 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 yes. yeah, yeah, resilience. absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, coming here, you know, I've, and, and, and I stay in Kharkiv, and, you know, like, the, uh, yesterday I was walking down, you know, the street in Lviv uh, here, and, and I was saying this to Orest, um, and there were so many people on the street, and I was so confused because I was like, is it the weekend? Is it Sunday? And it's not, it wasn't Sunday. Is it sunny? It's not sunny. And I, I was just very confused, and, you know, there's just such a there's such a less like density of people uh, in Kharkiv but the resiliency is is absolutely tremendous and amazing and everybody goes about, about their daily lives and you know as Johnny was saying you know a, a missile comes in one day and then the next day it's a beautiful sunny day and you know the soldiers I mean, you know maybe it's Sunday and soldiers are back rest and recovery uh, the girlfriends are dressed pretty or the boyfriends are you know depending on which way the relationship's going and you know, it's, it's just a beautiful to, thing to see because it, it shows that, you know, something Russian comes in and there's, you know, 2x the, the kind of resiliency that comes out of it. Mm. So there, it, it's what, whatever they send our way it kind of turns into more energy and sort of resiliency and it's, it's just amazing to see. Is, is that your impression too, Brooks? I mean, you must have heard stories from the London Blitz and people again, you know, being terrorized has the opposite effect. They're like, F you, I'm going to live my life and uh, not get cowed by it. Yeah, I mean, um, well, first of all, I want to say that the, the people I've seen as the most resilient are the women. I mean, I think the women, um, as I've seen really through the eyes of social media, have been incredible in this war. Uh, and as I said, again, particularly the young women, they have been the most vocal, the most... Uh, strong and uh, most resilient in expressing themselves, but they're they're expressing Ukraine, not just themselves. And I think that's been really interesting. I think when you look on social media and you look at um, the Ukrainian soldiers versus the Russian soldiers, there's almost a sense of humor that comes out. 
and playing on what you could not imagine the British Army or the American Army uh, or any other army in the world coming up with the humorous memes and, and pictures and so on. At the same time, you know, the next day you'll see incredible violence and they will show the real violence of war and what is going on. And I think that's what's been uh, particularly unique about this war. The anecdote I'm going to give is early on in the war, I had a, a mother and daughter who came and stayed uh, with us in London. And after about three months, um, the mother, you know, didn't speak any English or anything else, decided to go home. And so her daughter took her home. It was actually during the summer. Things were okay in Kyiv. And then, of course, the bombs started dropping again. So the daughter said to her mother, we've got to get back to London, you know, come back with me. And her comment was, if I'm going to die, I'd rather die in my apartment having Putin bombing me than to leave again. I am staying here. You can go back, but I am staying put. And that to me is a vignette of the resilience of people wanting to stay here. And I think the big challenge after the war is going to be getting a number of these families back. Because I think uh, my worry is a lot of the middle class families fled, the, fled here. And I think the longer this war goes on, the longer the children are in schools, wherever they are, it's going to be very difficult getting them to come back to this country. And I think that's going to be a, a big challenge. We're going to explore that theme later. We're going to unpack what victory means. We're going to talk about getting people back, getting their money back to rebuild Ukraine. We're also going to talk about getting the kidnapped children, the hundreds of thousands of children that have been taken out of the country. 700,000, I think. 700,000. It's an extraordinary, mind-boggling number. They have to be returned, every single individual one. We're going to unpack what victory means, not just on the battlefield, but uh, rolling that resilience out to every part of Ukraine, making it secure and rebuilding it. That brings this panel to an end, though. There's, I think, some extraordinary insights and incredible stories here. I want to thank our three panelists, not only for appearing here today, but for the incredible work they're doing for Ukraine. Please join me in applauding them. Thank you.